Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Mr. Adam Gust, who's drummer, speaker, educator, and uh, very excited to have you here. Welcome, oh, Adam. thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bart, for having me. I love the podcast you're doing, really. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, this this falls in line with more of some of the like uh, scientific kind of ones that we've done over the years, uh, more brain related. Uh, there's there's a handful of the episodes, which I will list them all in the description. Uh, Rob Latham's episode is coming to mind. Um, Steven Taylor did one on the science of like practice. There's a whole bunch of them. So I'll link those so people can uh, see those as well. But great. Um, so you are a monster drummer. I got to say right up front because your your <laughs> website, which is uh, let me let me plug it right here. Adam Gust, G-U-S-T dot com has some great examples of your playing. But you're you're kind of pivoting to um, be more in the speaking educational world, uh, which is very cool. So uh, let me cue this up. So today we're going to be talking about uh, and you have a much better explanation, but what I interpret it. It to be is how emotions play into your drumming, basically, and yeah. uh, your vagus nerve and your nervous mm -hmm. system and how it all plays together. So uh, all that being said, Adam, tell us more about this topic. Uh, this topic, yeah, well, it's been very influential in my life. I had an experience that caused me to really have to think outside the box in how to recover from an injury that I had. And that led yep. me down a path to find a lot of really new scientific research that's understanding better brain and body connectivity that has everything to do with drumming and affects all aspects of our life, really. And I, have, sure. I, I initially got into it because I was trying to find somebody to teach me about it. When I first learned that this research and perspective existed in early 2017, I was like, man, I got to find some drummer who's been applying this to drum pedagogy so I can get better as, you know, just internally and also in my performance. And I just couldn't find that person. So after seven years of studying and applying kind of the clinical application of nervous system science to drumming, I've feel like, oh, I've kind of become that person I was looking for in a sense. So. There you go. Sometimes you have to do that, where if, if no one else is doing it, then you should be the one. Uh, but you, you got to give us a quick rundown here, because I've seen it. You did a TED Talk. It's kind of a horror story, but maybe a quick rundown of just kind of what happened to you, because you were, you know, again, a working full-time drummer, and then something happened. So tell, tell us about that. Yeah, I was on a gig. Well, the TED Talk is Science of the Groove. And if you want to know more about it, please check it out. It's kind of the tree trunk that I'll be branching out from the rest of my life, I think. You know, I kind of built it to just be something that I can elucidate on from here on out. But uh, yeah, the, I was doing really well. I felt like I was on this upward trajectory in my life as a pro drummer in LA. And I was on a gig and I was walking towards the stage and there was a glass door there that I thought was open and it wasn't. And I walked through it and it should have been safety glass if it were up to the specs of at the time and it wasn't. It was outdated and it was real glass and it fast shard turned into shards and fell on me and it, it was a severe injury, particularly as a professional drummer, depending yeah. on our hands the way we do. Wow. <laughs> Terrible. I mean, it's it's a nightmare kind of situation. Um, so, okay, then then pick up from there. And again, you had to recover. You you couldn't play for a long time, but that obviously is what got you interested in all of this stuff to uh, connect the dots there, about how you go from that horrible incident to um, wanting to go down this, this path of, uh, you know, science and how it connects those two. Yeah, well, the connective tissue with what I'm doing now is the six years that went on with me being oblivious to what the solution was. And so yeah. I, I was getting this very strong and intense tension problem in my arm. And I was using kind of conventional means of thinking of how to deal with that in terms of healing and wellness. I thought, okay, I need to study some different techniques. I tried acupuncture. I tried, uh, I went to medical doctors. I tried to suss this out. And after six years, I've made some tiny improvements. Acupuncture did help a bit, but it just never got to a point where I felt like I was on par with people I was competing for work with. And I, did, I would not even want to go to jam sessions or even be involved in my drumming community in LA because I just didn't feel like I measured up because I had this just amateurish tension problem. When the stakes were high, 
my arm would tense up. And I mean, that's kind of like, that's what I associated with what an amateur is, you know, I mean, a yeah. pro rises to the occasion and that's, I was just incapable of that. And that just over six years, it eventually got me to the point that I just didn't want to be a drummer anymore. I just didn't feel like I measured up to my own standards. And mm. I realized that this was actually, this tension was my body trying to tell me something. And I just didn't get that at all. You know, I really thought that my brain is telling my arm what to do and it's not doing it. There's this brain problem. But I, and I just didn't see it, how it was this message coming back. Like my brain was sending a message to the arm, but there was this sensory information coming back from the arm telling me that, hey, there's some tension here that we need to resolve. And I just didn't wasn't aware of that until much later. Hmm. So, I mean, again, this is I'll, I'll ask the it might be a dumb question, but so it was not to break it down more. It's not a physical issue at that point then. It was more of the connection of the nerves and and uh, explain a little more about then how once you understand this and how you because you're you're playing great now. I've seen videos, Thanks. obviously. And h how does then this study and this, you know, uh, knowledge of what to do make you get over that that issue? Yeah, well, it was I reached this point where I just knew that I had to exit <laughs> my current situation because it wasn't working. I wasn't learning what I needed to know. And I really just didn't want to go on living that way. And so I took time. I took this cruise ship gig and it was six months. And I was just like, OK, I, if it's super cushy gig, 10 hours a week, uh, I totally lucked out. A friend hooked me up, Nikhil Karula. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, That's I mean, awesome. it gave me a lot of time to read a lot of books and do a lot of self-study. There was a guy I met on the ship, uh, Giorgio Rojas, who was really into Chinese martial arts and wellness, and I got to work with him a lot. And so it was just such a blessing for that to happen, because that's really where I started doing the work and looking inside. And I've read a bunch of books about psychology and biology and neurology. And then I came, the big turning point for me was Dr. Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. And that yep. was really the point where I kind of, oh, okay, there's this awareness in the body that my mind doesn't have. And that just isn't consistent with our culture in, in a sense. I mean, we kind of think like mostly from the top down, like the brain is telling the body what to do. And if the body isn't doing what the brain says, then there's a mental issue. And that's just yeah. not consistent with what Bessel van der Kolk's talking about, that it's really yeah. this coordinated conversation between the brain and the body. And yeah, ultimately it has everything to do with trauma. And it's like that word is something that might trigger some people, even just the word itself. But I like to dimension it as teaching resilience and understanding mindful awareness. That's why I like to think of it more like an acronym. Like it's sort of a call to action rather than this kind of stigma or something to, you know, kind of suppress. Sure. Um, so I've explained this on the show before, and I was telling you before that I have filmed psychology seminars for since I, uh, about 2016. And, um, I have heard the body keeps the score mentioned multiple times over the years, very famous book. Um, I've never read it, but I've heard many, many great things. Again, I'm the guy in the back with just the camera filming these <laughs> yeah. things, but, and I've, I've filmed presentations where they put the caps on people's heads and do like the neuro pathways and they control the video game, little games mm -hmm, with yeah. their, yeah. with their, uh, with their thoughts or mind power basically. Uh -huh. But, um, all right. So we're drummers. Uh, I will, I will speak to myself here. We're, we're, we're simple people. Uh, so let's, <laughs> let's break this down to how does this apply yeah. to people who are listening, who are. They don't have the traumatic experience of walking through a, you know, outdated plate glass window and shattering it and not being able to play. But I've got some shoulder pain. I've had lower back pain. We, we all have these from a life of drumming. Yeah. Or maybe someone doesn't have any pain, but they just want to get, you know, they want to move forward in their in their plane. Let's get into now. How does how does this apply to like everyone in different situations how can every drummer get better by knowing this this uh stuff yeah well we use our nervous system to play drums and sure. it, i really like to think of the best drummers as sharing a lot with the best best athletes i mean it takes a lot of mind body coordination in order to fulfill our intentions of excellence and there's definitely this connection in terms of modern nervous system research that connects healing with performance. In fact, there's a view of 
healing that our, our resilience is basically healing in real time. And to mm. be resilient in a performance is key to being a professional. I mean, they, when stuff goes wrong, that's the job. I really like this Robert Rodriguez interview with the Tim Ferriss podcast where he says, like, you know, if, if you're not being a professional if everything is going right. Like, the job is fixing stuff that goes wrong. And I, sure. that made a lot of sense to me because I've been in situations where things go wrong and that's really where you kind of start seeing who who is more or less professional, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah. Oh, my so, God, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right? And so I really want to be a professional. And for, for the longer the six-year period, I noticed when things went wrong i was not a professional and so that's when i realized like healing has everything to do with performance being able yeah. to heal in real time being present being aware of the information your body's giving you and so yeah the kind of the hook of the the interview i'd like to give i've worked with a lot of singer songwriters and i feel like i've always had to support the hook you know and so like i i would like to for this interview like to support this hook of the idea how much we lack awareness of our current emotional state is how much we take out our emotions on others and ourselves and the groove as drummers and so like yeah. any hook it's worth repeating you know how much we lack awareness of our current emotional state is proportional it's directly proportional to how much we take out we reduce and damage our interactions with others ourselves and our drumming and so that's so if really, you're not taking yeah. care of yourself and treating yourself well and taking care of your own uh, everything, you are then going to be in life probably a jerk to other people <laughs> and you're not going to perform your best on the drums because you're just bottling everything up and being tense and not, uh, you know, taking care of the things you should take care of. Is that a simple <laughs> yeah yeah a jerk it. to other people from the drums is rushing not grooving not listening playing too loud not giving the music what it's calling for you know yeah. that's kind of being selfish or just being completely disconnected from our emotions leads to a lot of disconnection from the music we're making and so the music connect music connectivity with this work is it's really deep and so it but it starts internally like we have to be in unison with ourselves before we can be in unison with anyone else i mean you know if we can't play a unison between our four limbs we're never gonna like kind of be able to connect with some bass player or guitar player who's hyper developed unison between their two hands so yeah, yeah the work the work has to, i mean so music is just a reflection of this overarching concept of you know we need to be aware of this sensory information our current emotional state is essentially the sensory information that's being fed to us by our body you mentioned the vagus nerve which is integral to this work and structure and function of the vagus nerve is crucial to understanding this because there are four times more neuro transmissions coming up the vagus nerve to the brain than there are going down which means we yep. have evolved to be hypersensitive to this information that our body is giving us, but that's not reflected in kind of our cultural attitudes towards mind-body connectivity. Yeah, so, okay, back up a second. Let's yeah. define the vagus nerve. Because, okay. uh, again, in my experience of filming uh, workshops, and, and I, again, to explain a little further, these workshops are for people who have to keep their if you're a psychologist or social worker or whatever, you have to take courses to keep your license. That's mm -hmm. what I've been filming. Yeah. So the importance of the vagus nerve has come up multiple times. So can you give a little more definition for, you know, the, the layman who may not know what it is? Sure. Yeah, it's a very complex system of nerves, but it's called one, it's called the vagus nerve, but it's actually an entire system that comes from, because uh, it's cranial nerves that come out of the base of the brain and go all the way down our body in this very mangled sort of network, which is why it's called Vegas. Vegas means wanderer. Las Vegas mm. is for wanderers wandering, wandering the desert. And That's so, interesting. Yeah, and I so, didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. It's this very <laughs> wandering kind of nerve because all, all of our other nerve structures are very symmetrical. So the motor nerves come down from the brain and go down the front of the spine and kind of branch out to the limbs in a very symmetrical pattern. And then the sensory nerves come up the back of the spine very symmetrically. But but this vagus nerve is something different and it even is akin to the structure of our organs like our body is very symmetrical except for our organs and so i think like yeah. evolutionarily this is kind of cueing us in like okay there's needs to be some special attention paid 
to this because it's out of the ordinary. Everything else is kind of a bit even like mechanical looking how symmetrical it is. But the vagus nerve really, it carries a lot of emotional information that's being sent up from the organs and it directly connects to the face. So there connects through the top of the eyes, the forehead and under the eyes, and then also around the mouth. It goes up to our ears. It affects our hearing, it goes a mm. laryngeal, pharyngeal branches, which are kind of in the th- top and bottom of the throat. And it connects our pers- or it influences our perception of time, our coordination, our fingertip sensitivity, our emotional state. I mean, these are and when I was learning about this, it's like, oh my God, this is yeah, the like holy, <laughs> this is the holy grail for drummers. Like, who yeah. is out there bringing Vegas nerve research to the drums? Where are they? Tell me what their hourly rate is. I'll pay it. You know, <laughs> just yeah. like yeah, what? yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there was all kinds of these. Uh, well, I, I contacted a lot of psychologists who had been doing this work, and they're like, oh, well, it's been very well established that you know, drumming and the Vegas nerve research are connective. And I was like, where's the drum set player? And so there's a uh, rhythm to recovery. There's like a lot of hand drumming. There's rhythm and bliss. There's, uh, yeah, La- oh, uh, I think Rob Latham, you talked about, he does hand drumming and yep. trauma work with kids. But in terms of a drum set pedagogy, I just like, where is that person and why do they not exist? Yeah. Yeah. Cause if you're, I mean, it makes you, like you said, drumming and it kind of relates to like being athletes where if you're mm-hmm. trying to be the best of the best, those and you're figuring out the the minor things that you can change or if you're if you're already in very good shape but you're wanting to get that much better looking at this kind of stuff is is how you can do that uh or if you're like 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 a normal you know joe then uh just addressing this could could be very beneficial to your plane and it's interesting because when you google it um you know take it for what it's worth because it's it's Mm -hmm. google but it's just it's interesting to say that it's the involuntary body functions including digestion heart rate immune system breathing cardiovascular activity uh reflex actions such as coughing sneezing it's it's like and and so much more like you said but the involuntary thing is very interesting because it's like you can't control it i love that you brought up that word because that is of a perspective that i want to talk about so there is a cultural attitude of what is involuntary and what isn't. So Mm. there's this language that's coming up from the body as sensory information, which in my TED talk, I talk about, I say that sensation is a language and I feel Mm. like I do a fairly good job of (laughs) describing and kind of putting it in that context. And so we usually think of language as, you know, the brain establishes language and that's how we communicate. But really interpreting this language of the body is the key to this work. And that might sound a little woo woo to certain people, the language of the body, but I feel like culturally speaking that is woo woo in terms of western culture but in other cultures it makes absolute sense you know martial mm-hmm. arts and <clears throat> yoga and this chakras and i mean this is all thousands of year old cultures that understand that language of the body is hyper important to us yep. our wellness and our performance and healing yeah, yeah. Yes, totally. I would agree completely. And the TED Talk is awesome. I'll put it in oh, the thanks. description for everyone to, to see. You did a very good job with that. Um, all right. Well, then the question at hand would be, how do people work on uh, either repairing or focusing or just, you know, addressing the vagus nerve? Like, what yeah. are some tactics to to see if you need help. You might not yeah. even know you, you need help. You know. <laughs> yeah, well, the first thing to do is to get rid of the word involuntary. I, I think that's... Uh, like, okay, I that feel, was Google's fault. That yeah, was no, 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 absolutely. I'm, I love that I'm you brought that up because yeah. that is this kind of Western idea like, well, the, the brain controls the body. And so the first thing to know is that there's um, primacy of affect. Uh, Dan Siegel, uh, Dr. Siegel at US or UCLA, he's been working on this, this understanding that there's a lot of sensory information coming up from the body that it happens before cognition, like two to three milliseconds. Like our mm. feeling initiates our thoughts. And that has not been the case for a very long time. We, I mean, ever since Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, we assume that the brain is running the whole show f- for 400 years. All of our systems and education, philosophy, politics, everything has been sure. predicated on this idea that the brain runs the show. And so that's like, oh yeah, so well, the brain runs the show, anything coming up is involuntary. And that's not the case. And I can, I can prove it to you right now. Uh, a little experiential I'd like to do. 
Russ, uh, we have yep. drummers in the audience. Uh, I imagine you have a metronome app on your phone. So yes. I'd like you to take your left hand and put folks out there. You can put it up against your throat and you can feel your pulse, hopefully. Can you feel there your is. heart yep. beating there? All right. And then whip I, for those of you listening at home, you can whip out your app and bring up the tap function and just start tapping along with your heart rate. And there we are finding out the BPM measure of our heart rate in our current emotional state. Now we are going to affect our emotional state by focusing on our breath. So I'd for, now, as you tap the tap function, I'd like you to breathe in for 10 heartbeats. And as you breathe out, breathe out for 10 heartbeats. And so now keep doing this as you listen to me. It's a little bit of a guided meditation. And so you will eventually, ideally, notice that as you inhale, your heart rate increases. And as you exhale, your heart rate decreases. This is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. This is the vagus nerve releasing a little bit of its control, the vagal break over the heartbeat on the inhale, which increases the heart rate. Anyway, I'll <laughs> yeah. I'll get out of the clinical idea of a more kind of thing of the, so the idea is that we do have conscious control over our heart rate and our heart rate has control over our emotional state. So if you as you continue to do this exercise and the longer you inhale and exhale, you'll start to notice this heart rate variability, which is the shift in your heart rate and how it relates to breath. So if you want to downregulate your nervous system, you would breathe in quickly and then exhale for a long time, thereby making the average you know, increase or decrease of your heart rate go lower. And mm. so this guy, like singers get this because they take fast breaths in order to sing. And so it just kind of undermines this idea that everything's involuntary. You know, I mean, we, we sure. can voluntarily control our breath, which, volu- which controls our heart rate. And I use that all the time. And then the amount we breathe in also affects our, the level of oxygenation of our body, which has a huge impact on how well we're able to pr- perform. Yeah, well, and, and it goes to the, the, I think everyone, it's pretty common knowledge that if you, you know, we drum early on in drumming, you, you, you kind of tense up and you don't breathe uh, very well when you're, when you're like, you know, early on in your drumming journey and sometimes still, but like, then you speed up or you're not that yep. you're not, you're, you're getting off the, the metronome, but when you breathe it, you, you, you are more relaxed and you don't speed up, which, you know, I guess is kind of a practical example of that in, in, in play. Yeah, exactly. Tension has everything to do with it and movement and emotion have a lot of connectivity. Uh, in fact, even when we're not visibly moving, we are still moving. Our heart Mm. is moving. And in terms of a somatic perspective, somatic means of the body. The somatic understanding of movement is any neural transmission that activates the compression or expansion of muscle tissue. And so according to that, the somatic movement, the heart beating is movement. And so, and our rate of our heartbeat completely has an influence over our emotional state. So movement and emotion are just inextricably linked. And yeah. And sure. so, yeah, that's a so somatic movement is a huge part of this. In fact, the, the methodology I've been working on based on a lot of somatic therapies is this idea of feeling and releasing tension. Like, I mean, we, there are so many people, oh, you got to play relaxed as a drummer. Oh, how do you play relaxed? I don't know. You know, <laughs> I was it, yeah, this, that's true. Yeah. yeah, I was doing this drum clinic, and I remember the drum. This particular drummer was talking all about relaxation. I was like, "Well, do you have some ways to tell us to play relaxed?" You know, and he was like, "Well, I can't really sit here, Adam, and tell you how to play relaxed." And I was like, "Really? I can." <laughs> you know, yeah. so well, I really feel let's like, hear it. What do you what What do you think? I mean, it, that's a perfect practical thing. I love when people yeah. can just like do it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, so the first thing I think that's why feeling and releasing tension. That's like feeling comes first. 
again, it's kind of undermining this Western traditional view of the mind being in control. Like, in, in fact, uh, embodied cognition research is finding that movement has everything to do with sensation. It's like a GPS. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to know where you are before you can know where you're going. And so you need to sense body position, proprioception. The brain has to create this prediction coding as how to get from point A to point B. And so it tries to move and then it assesses the movement and sees how well it's doing going from point A to point B and it corrects along the way. And the correction process is all sensory information. And so mm -hmm. as much as we think of movement and tension as being controlled by the brain, a larger percent of it is uh, it's very much connected to sensory information. And so that's and so even though we think our brain is in control, it's really like our reaction to the sensory information that has everything to do with movement and tension. And so I like yeah. so this methodology, I like to call it uh, fe feeling and releasing tension is essentially the fart methodology because <laughs> i like <laughs> to, i like to kind of i don't want to take it all so seriously you know like yes. we get into some pretty deep concepts of emotional overwhelm and i do, i remember a, a wise person once told me if you can't explain it to a fifth grader you don't understand it yourself and so i was like oh well dang i better be able to explain it to a fifth grader so yep. i imagine myself in a fifth grade class and i was like let's talk about farts so I mean, so, I have a four-year-old, and we talk about farts <laughs> many times in the in the day. So I'm, I'm you've now got my attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's really a metaphor for somatic therapy, the way I see it. So it's because it's really this integration of the outside world, our mental world, and our biological world. And so they're all. I mean, it gets super heavy, kind of the, all of the inputs into describing this. But I think if we all think of we all have to fart, we all have this waste gas that builds up. And if we didn't have a way to release it, we would die. We would rupture internally. And so mm -hmm. first, first our body lets us know, hey, I'm feeling this tension internally that I need to release. Then it lets the brain know that, okay, I'm feeling it. Let's like perform the necessary functions to let this come out. But wait a minute. I'm in my fifth grade class. My teacher's here. My classmates are here. Whoa, 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 hold up. You know, brain's like, uh, Brody, I got a problem here. You know, we can't let this yeah. happen. It's going to be embarrassing. The outside world is restricting our ability to release this tension. And so we hold it. And so, okay, well, how long are we going to hold it? Well, how long are we in the class? And this tension eventually builds. And so this has a lot to do with systems theory. I wouldn't mention that in a fifth grade class. But, but essentially, yeah. it's showing like, okay, there's this whole coordination going on between the outside world, our thought process, and our body. And when we get home, okay, fine, we can let it, you know, release the tension there, ideally. But still, yeah. I mean, without consequence. <laughs> but, the, but the point being, there's, we had to feel... The tension first and so a lot of other forms of tension that happen in the body we struggle to feel because our culture has it's kind of dismissed and devalued how important sensory information is in our lives in a lot of ways yeah i mean and and really to again on the fifth grader thing you're holding that in it's probably going to be more painful if yep. it, if it slips out it's probably going to be louder and you're going to be more embarrassed yeah the f the fart the fart uh theory really does work though because then you're holding it in and everything's getting worse <laughs> exactly so, it's so cyclical it's not good. yeah it yes. just it's compounds on itself and yes. so yeah and so that's really what somatic therapies uh, the one that i uh, participated in i was a client of somatic experiencing which is a somatic trauma therapy and the therapist i worked with debbie j god bless her she did Whew, wow man <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Uh, man, I get a little emotional when I think about it. She was able to pair Alexander Technique and Somatic Experiencing in a way that not only did I find so much resolution of tension, but also mm. so much improvement here at the drums. I mean, I sure. just was released so much, and it just feels so much better to play drums. And that was really that moment when I was like, wow, healing and performance are really two sides of the resilience coin they're really just there there's a relationship there that i think we need to understand as drummers yeah okay but again to kind of put this a little simpler and even in drummer terms all Please. farting aside um <laughs> feeling and releasing let's just have a practical example of like a drummer who's working nine to five who goes home uh, i mean would, would the the feeling would the issue be like a stressful day would it be there's something tension in your body would it be there's literally a damaged like ligament or, or all of the above and then how can that drummer 
really address this and fix it on their own without, you know, or at least begin to fix it on their own. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to answer that with a few examples, but first I'd like to mention this uh, work, these workshops I did with Sabian Education Network. So I was working on this stuff for a long time. I was trying to figure out how to connect it with drummers. And I saw Dom Famularo talking about physical manifestations of tension with an emotional basis. And so he yep. was talking about injury prevention for drummers. He had Dr. Nadia Azar talk about this musculoskeletal perspective she's taking, I mean, it's, which is brilliant. He talked about trigger finger and dystonia, which for a long time have thought to be neurological, but there's a lot of evidence that it's actually biological. In fact, Victor mm. Wooten was working on his dystonia with uh, Dr. Ruth Childs, who mm. it wasn't looking at his hand. She was looking at his autonomic nervous system, the vagus nerve, which is the key to our autonomic nervous system. And so there is this nervous system kind of interface with everything that we do. We can't sure. just fix the brain. And so I'd like to just so I'll, maybe in the, the links below the and for this episode, yep. we can give a referral to the Sabian Education Network, the workshops I did, because it has Dom's workshops and Nadia's and two of mine. I did one, and the community there insisted on another. <laughs> it was, That's great. I really, it was great. It felt really good to me to connect with that audience. I met Dom uh, through a friend of mine, Tony Bronigal at NAM, and he, I said, yeah, I feel like I have a yes and voice to this thing you're talking about, injury prevention from a nervous system perspective. And he was like, man, let's get your stuff going. He had me on SEN. And of course, we lost Dom a few days yes. ago, which is Rest just- Rest in peace to Dom. Amazing yeah. guy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the outpouring of love for that man on social media has been overwhelming. And yeah. I just really want to honor him in any way I can. And uh, but, I mean, even one person posted uh, that he wrote this book, Emotions and Motion, and the kind of the theme of somatic drummer, my methodology is the language of emotions in motion. I'm like, okay, wow, yeah, there's he's on to something that he was coming from a different angle than I am. And I definitely want to yes and, you know, what what he was doing and kind of the towards the end of his career yes. as an educator and inspiring person. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So um, again, some some things that people to get back to that, that like, uh, if uh, examples of something someone can do at home, like uh, are there yeah. tactics that you like to do relaxation things or just meditation, mm -hmm. yoga? What What is something that people can do kind of as they're sitting there in their drum room that you it, recommend? Yeah, the first thing is breath. That's a breath affecting yep. heart rate because that Got is it. our yep. control of our emotional state because emotional state, when it gets elevated, it triggers tension in the body. And so I feel like a lot of people focus on, oh, I have tension here, I need to address the tension specifically, but oftentimes it's a reflex that the body has to an increase in elevated emotional state. So the first thing I like to think of is resourcing the nervous system. And so there's a there's an acronym I love for that that I stole from the Esalen Institute, some trainings that I did there, which is GRACE. So grounding, relaxation, awareness, centering, and energizing. And I added mm -hmm. one in this, I've talked about it in my SEN thing, the synergizing. So it's essentially like a six way program for four way coordination. So feet to hands, hand to feet, left to right, right to left, and then cross left hand, right foot to right hand, left foot, and then the opposite. And so I talked about this program, which goes into more detail, but essentially, I think if you're sitting there at a pad and you're practicing rudiments and you're not paying at all attention to what your feet are doing, you're missing out. Like there's a whole lot of stability that you could be imbuing and bringing into your body just by having your heels on the floor. And I think mm -hmm. heel up technique is a serious problem for a lot of drummers and you're, anyone's welcome to send me all the hate mail they want, but I'm gonna say this. When you go to open hi-hats, how can you possibly play heel up? So you're playing along, closed hi-hats, your chorus kicks in, you go to open hi-hats. If you're playing heel up, you have to drop the heel. You can't just mm -hmm. suspend your leg there. And the yep. minute you go from heel up to heel down in a shift change or a scene change in the music, you are reorienting your entire grounding. <laughs> and this might seem sure. like a small thing to so many people, but oh my God, it's not. 
Like it is not a, it is such a big deal to shift how we are planted on the ground because our nervous system job for hundreds of thousands of years is to keep us from face planting. And so the minute we start messing with how grounded we are with our heels on the ground, our nervous system elevates. It's like, oh, oh, mm. we're on our heels. We can, well, we must be ready to run, or we must be ready to fight, or mm. so it immediately activates. So if you're practicing rudiments on a drum pad, make sure that your heels are planted. And so the next thing from there I like to think of is we need to have an awareness of when we shift from heel to toe. Because heel to toe is, I mean, you can play just heel down, you can play just heel up, but I feel like advanced drummers, they have some understanding of this, this variation, this relationship between heel yep. and toe. In martial arts, it's very prevalent. In hands, I like to think of it as like push-pull. So like this, so this is kind of more closed and this is more open and going between the two in hand balance, the radial median yep. ulnar nerves. It gets into a whole lot of kind of somatic therapy and kind of work that's being done with the nervous system. But just shifting back and forth from heels to toes because we want to try to get a little more concrete here. So if you're pulsing, if you're playing rudiments and you have a metronome going, just try to like drop your heels together and then move to the toes and just try to go back and forth. And now we want to connect that grounding with the back of the neck because the back of the neck is where all of our sensory information is coming up the back of our spine now from kind of the, the limbs, not the vagus nerve, but the, the limbs, all that information, the back of the neck. And so if we can connect this back of the neck, which is about a two to three millisecond latency from the cueing any neural activity in the feet, but then we can kind of like pulse when we go to the heels, drop the head back. And we go to the toes, drop the head just a little bit forward. And this is a vagus nerve regulation exercise. Studies have shown that just doing this kind of regulates the nervous system. It calms us. That's why, hmm. well, probably why mentally ill people do it, because it calms them. Oh, that's them. interesting. Yeah, and just like, just like doing this pulse, it, it helps to kind of center us. It gives us more composure. And so just by heels to toes and just coordinating this bottom of our body to this more top of our body while we're playing rudiments. And so the next level of this is to alternate that, to drop the right heel with the left toe and now orient that. So we drop left heel, right toe. I'm sorry, left heel, right toe, and then right heel, left toe. So just try wow. like see what that feels like and see if you can wow. even play a unison. Yeah. And then are you... Are you doing, are you like alternating that kind of to the, the rhythm that yeah. you're playing there? Okay. Yeah, same yeah. thing. You have the metronome on, you're practicing whatever rudiments, whatever stickings, whatever hand stuff you're working on on the pad. And so just being able to understand this difference between heels to toes and alternating le alternating left to right. And so then you can start kind of playing paradiddles and keeping pulse in the feet that way. And suddenly yeah. the bra brain and body are like, okay, we're kind of working on balance. And so I do this when I'm standing. Because yeah. I think a lot of problems that drummers have is they expect the drum throne to balance us. And that's one of the worst things you can do. You, if the more balance you can bring to your feet and the less strain on your tailbone, the more your nervous system is going to be regulated. And ultimately, the fewer problems you're going to have with your back later on when you're yeah. over 50 like I am. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. And so, that what, so if you do this when you're standing, you, this is a serious balance exercise. I mean, to go play like one pair, like paradiddle paradiddle yeah. sorry if you're just listening to the podcast you missed the visual but yeah so alternating do, feet yeah. kind of yeah. movement yeah so there's yeah. first heel to toes you can do rudiments heels to toes and then there's this alternating which is really a heavier version of balance and coordinating so this is just grounding i mean in terms yeah. of like the six layers of the graces this is just grounding and so this is the first step before we get to relaxation is just mm. no like that's like kind of sweet before you mop like make sure first <laughs> that your yeah. nervous system feels like it's not going to face plant that's like step one right sure and it's so and there's so much work you can do with that with just a pad like i think i feel like there's you know if you're working with a kid with just working on his rudiments on a pad like make sure that you're paying attention to his feet making sure he or she is grounded I mean, that has, yeah, that's true. yeah. So that's one kind of more granular <laughs> aspect. Yeah. Of this. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good thing that's, um, again, I think in my experience of filming these things and talking about these topics, they can be, uh, overwhelming 
which I think if you're speaking, you've been studying this for years, you've seen a lot of the, I mean, it, it helped you a lot. But for someone who's, again, listening to a, you know, 50, 60 minute long podcast, it's it's kind of the getting it in their, their mind to like, it's good to have those simpler ways to start, I think. And, mm-hmm. and awareness is huge to be able to be cognizant of, uh, like you said, that it's not involuntary and you can control these things. Yeah. I think it's huge. So you starting can, yeah. and being aware is big. Yeah. I'd like to, you can influence it. It's not completely involuntary. Like just sure. as, yeah, like the, I like this BMW, like God, I'm, I like to roll up in life in a 2023 BMW. <laughs> it's got all the latest <laughs> technology, great body. It's got a really efficient use of fuel. And so BMW isn't an automobile. It's actually body, mind, work. World. It's this okay, biopsychosocial yeah. science, which is really cute. And ever since the functional magnetic resonance imaging machine was a technological advancement in science in the 90s that gave us movies of neural transmissions rather than just snapshots, that's changed the game in our mm. understanding of brain body connectivity. And that was 30 years ago. And so, but I think wow. there's like so many of our systems are still kind of thinking of this brain, you know, leading the game in this bo- mind body connection. But the science, the technology has proven otherwise. And it's like we all need to catch up, really. And yeah, yeah, so yeah, absolutely. So, um, if it's, it's an interesting thing, like it would yourself pre accident with your hands would you have believed that you know in in you know however many years ago that was 20 years ago or whatever it is were you always kind of into this stuff or was this like totally not even on your radar to begin with and i mean that by giving people hope like i'm not this isn't my world and there's a lot of people who have no concept of this which i'm more in that camp or is were you always inclined to this kind of thing absolutely not zero (laughs) And that's and it's been such a benefit to me because I feel like I have this kind of consultant who was me before my accident. Like anytime I think of something, I'm like, man, what would pre-accident Adam think of this? And it's so funny. Like I feel like it's almost this other person because I had no clue. And it's been a complete shift in my view of the world. And so, yeah, and to think like, man, I'm no scientist. What the heck am I applying nervous system science to drumming? But I'm at this point, like uh, Dr. Pamela Serafin, I've done trainings with her. I remember uh, Rob Latham talked about, you know, working with her. She came to my SEN workshop and I was really curious what she would think. You know, it's like, oh, man, was all my theory okay? You know, she has a, you know, a doctorate in nervous uh, or uh, neuroscience. And I was kind of yep. worried what she'd say. And she's like, Adam, you are kind of overboard on the theory. <laughs> she's like, you need to like dial that back in terms of a workshop, half as much theory, twice as much concrete. And so that's really what's kind of her consultation with that and her help and her brilliance. I mean, she's really ahead of the game in applying neuroscience to drumming as a drummer and a like, <laughs> you know, with being a PhD neuroscientist. So, yeah, yeah really like, OK, wow, I need to make this more accessible. And so I'm trying to do that. And I saw so, when I really appreciate you having me on this podcast and talking to talking with me and like any questions you have, any rewording you have is vital information for me. Oh, yeah. Well, you're uh, you're doing, you did an amazing job. You are doing an amazing job, but she is right where I I have, again, in my experience of filming these, we, we get, um, you know, you get, you give people give feedback at the end. And sometimes what happens is people will say like, even in a room full of like psychologists and therapists, even people of that level don't want it to be nonstop theory. They want to hear the funny stories and the practical kind of examples of how to actually use this. So then they can then translate it to their everyday life or their clients or whoever. So um, yeah. that's that's great advice. And I'm sure it's, uh, you know, you, you've done a phenomenal job of explaining it. And, and I, I am a big believer in like, um, if you're trying to lose weight, like walk five minutes and then the next day walk six minutes and then, then seven minutes. Like you just, you don't need to go nuts overboard with all of this. So I think right away, just what you've talked about, about being aware of your breathing, and calming things down and just knowing that it's what's going on in there and how it's all connected is is huge for people. Um, I think that's a good starting point. 
Yeah, I love that you connected weight loss and breath because I would have never thought that those two things had anything to do with each other. But it brings up an opportunity to talk about how meaningful it is to breathe less. Uh, there's a, this conflicting idea that, okay, we need oxygen in the body. Let's breathe in a bunch of oxygen. And so if we breathe in a ton of oxygen, we can hyperventilate. And is that, is that an over-oxygenation of the brain? No, it's actually the brain not getting enough oxygen. And so there's sort of this cognitive version of that, like, what? How can taking in too much oxygen result in a lowering of oxygen in the brain? And it's because we our blood gets so oxygenated that it the pH goes into base, that which means that the hemoglobin can't release the oxygen into our tissues. And so so it needs to in, we need to increase the acidity in our bloodstream in order to oxygenate our tissues, which means breathing less oxygen, which is super counterintuitive, but it's called the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R. I am not making this up. <laughs> and so, but what's funny is like so many people, they have this strong inclination towards acidic food, often because it's the body crying out for acid in the blood to oxygenate its tissues that it needs. And so there's just like the breath is so important, but somehow it got kind of cast in the woo-woo bin. You know, like somebody, I'm a licensed certified breath practitioner with oxygen advantage. And I've because I felt it through polyvagal theory, I did a certification with them. I've been a mentor for the last two years for with Michael Allison, and just working with all these people studying polyvagal theory. And like the breath is just the baseline, just like the feet are the baseline of relaxation. The breath is the baseline of uh, all the organizing principles of how our body works. And yeah, I'm sure. Uh, it as we kind of get close to the end here, I think mm -hmm. that uh, I've heard a lot in my experience of the seminars of the importance of sleep as well. That has to play into this to some degree. I mean, I'm very, I think we're all kind of uh, guilty every now and then of not sleeping enough or just not getting it regulated. Or there's kind of the um, you hear about sometimes how it's like oh, I was up all night working. It's kind of like, again, it's more of a culture thing where it's like, it can seem like a good thing, like cranking and just cramming all night to get something done where really focusing on sleep will make you better at drumming and, you know, f more focused and the, th the things you practice will actually be retained more. Um, yeah. Has sleep come up in your, your work? Oh, it's sleep and breath again. Yeah. yeah. I have, I have a little kind of admission to make is that I have developed some tinnitus that caused some problems with me sleeping and I've mm -hmm. had to do breath exercises that help me fall asleep and down regulating the heart rate according to breath is huge for sleeping it makes a big difference and so yeah I'd like to kind of ask you like okay here we are coming towards the end of this I'm I feel like I've done a lot of work trying to bring scientific understanding of the body into drumming and now at this point I feel like wow next year I really need to kind of flip the script on it and feel like how to explain this to drummers so in terms of like what do you think landed with you having done all these podcasts and being a drummer yeah well, I, I would say first off, let's open it up to people in the comments uh, on YouTube Please, who are watching yeah, yeah. this because I, I think, and, and I mentioned this to Adam before, and I think this is interesting for people uh, listening, that sometimes um, people get defensive when they're being told things about maybe their body. If you're saying something physiologically about the way I am and what I'm not doing, uh, I'm not talking about me, but I'm saying mm -hmm. a person would get offended by that. So I think that's something that's a, a watch out and you didn't do this at all, but I'm saying, uh, in, in, you get, you need to be careful of that whenever presenting stuff like this, because, uh, I remember with the Brandon green episode, which he did a phenomenal job about, uh, the ergonomics and drumming. People said, don't talk about buddy rich and how he was bent over and things like that. And Brandon and I talked about that, but, um, uh, I would say the takeaway I've gotten from this especially is just I like the practical things that you brought forward of, of drummers need examples. How can this help me? What's an example of what's wrong? How can it be fixed? Uh, I think you did a good job of that. Uh, and, and basically, like anything in, in presenting, uh, a good call to action. You know what I mean? I think that that's really we all like to walk away with a, what can I do right now? Which I think, again, the sleep, being aware 
knowing about our breathing, a couple couple exercises, I think it uh, drove it home. But again, let's open up people in the comments. Let's hear what you think too about this whole topic. Yeah, a final takeaway. I'm trying to think of like, what's the button to put on the end of this? And I just really feel like there's this drum education systems focus on the brain telling the body what to do. And so there's some, I feel like almost we need to kind of get out of our drumming education systems in order to better understand how our body works because we all have these sort of funnels that we immediately fall into when we talk about drumming and i mean one of the biggest benefits that i've found for my drumming has been japanese fighting staff and that's mm. i've never like i would have never thought this would have been the case but as i've looked back like i've really been exploring like who is the first drummer you know, who, why do we play drums? Like this person evolved, there was this body mind connectivity that eventually evolved to the point that we changed the elements of our environment to create these tools to communicate through rhythm. And like, why did that happen? What evolved? And the vagus nerve is a huge part of that. Like why social engagement? I mean, that could go down a whole rabbit hole with that. But I feel like I've traced that and I've been moving forward and I was like, where did stick control? How did suddenly we only have French, German and American and like how, you know, the Gruber and Stone yep. and Gladstone and blah, 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 blah. Like where did what isn't there just kind of like a universal movement that we all can work on? And I've so I, that's mm. when I started noticing like, wow, the Japanese fighting staff was really like the first recorded stick control in the history of humans and so i started messing with it and i've started noticing like wow it's all about expanding infinity and so that might sound strange but to the body it makes total sense so within whatever range of motion we're capable of we have an infinite access to movement like we can move in an infinite number of ways according to however whatever our range of motion is but if we expand that then we can We've just expanded our infinity of movement. And so, so oftentimes it's beyond that threshold of movement that we currently have that we gain access to playing the drums. Because the more we can reduce how much we move our body and increase how much we move the stick, the tool of drumming, the better we can play drums. And I know that Gruber's technique has a lot to do with that. And there's all these complex ways to, you know, deal with fingers. But I've noticed, like, when you start working with a bow staff and you don't worry about rebound, you really start to find where those movement inhibitions are that live in the mm. body. And that can cue you into to where tensions lie and how our biography is imprinted on our biology, how like our lives, where we hold tension and why. And so I've, anyone who's struggling or feel like they plateaued as a drummer, I would highly recommend just go on YouTube, get a dowel, a four foot dowel from Home Depot and just start moving it around in the air. And I mean, just this movement, well, it's hard to do on screen, but like once you can get that movement and you really kind of understand where the parameters are of that movement and applying it to the drums, like a whole world opens up rather than reducing yeah, wow. it down to just American, German and French. <laughs> Yeah. And if you're married or have a girlfriend or boyfriend, don't tell them you're going to do it. So they walk in and eat you just <laughs> messing around with a uh, dowel that you got from the hardware store. <laughs> yeah, no, That's actually, awesome. Yeah. That's really a cool idea. I mean, that's really unique because it's all this movement of your shoulders and everything. And it, it's that's a unique uh, exercise. Very unique. Yeah. yeah. I mean, essentially, it's like and the funny thing about that is that that philosophy like especially Chinese and Japanese martial arts, they have a whole associated emotional aspect that ties into that. Like Giorgio Rojas, I have to thank him for kind of hipping me to that. Tai Chi movement has been something that's made a huge difference for me. I feel like our best drumming lives outside the range of our current range of motion. Like once we can expand how much we move and then you start noticing, wow, I can't move as much on my left side. Why is that? And so you start expanding that and suddenly you get this symmetry and then it's a nervous system just like, oh, gimme, gimme. You know, it's yeah. like, wow, yeah. OK, now instead of like trying to compensate for my left hand dragging because of this asymmetrical tension, now that I relieve that, I can just let rhythm flow out of me. And that has everything to do with somatic experiencing, somatic movement. And yeah, just how stress lives in the body as pattern tension. Yes. And it's not uncommon. It's a pretty common theme that there's a lot of drummers who have studied martial arts mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that's actually sort of a common thing. And I see it now. They post on social media and stuff like that. And Buddy Rich was into martial arts and all that stuff. So um, that's cool. And you also said Expanding Infinity. That's a cool jam band name or, or a uh, fusion <laughs> band. Uh, so if all else fails, you can... Uh, we can start expanding infinity. Oh, uh, shucks! And, uh, I better grab that URL. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get the uh, get the hashtag or the yeah the the at. Um, all right, Adam. Well, let's tell people now as we kind of uh, get close to the end here uh, where they can find you. We will put all the links for the TED Talk and everything in the description. But maybe do you have anything coming up here? Uh, it's October 2023 when we're recording this. Anything coming up you want to promote uh, right now and plus the links and all that stuff? Yeah, well, okay, uh, adamgus.com. I'd like to include the referral link with Sabian Education Network because that's anyone who's found this interesting. There's two or complete hours of me talking about this and the folks who checked it out, I've gotten an incredible response. That's re- the, the response is really what's kept me going. It's really met some people on a technique level. It's met others on an emotional level. And then there have been some folks that uh, there are some folks that who are who are dealing with some overwhelm or injury. There's not a lot for drummers out there. If you want to check out my trauma story on my YouTube page, Adam Gust, I've, there are some folks that that meant something to them. I wish that that had existed when I had my accident. And so that's really sure. the reason I'm doing this. It's not to make. I mean, I feel like. I do need to eventually make a business out of this if I'm going to continue to do this work. But really, the reason I'm doing this is because I see this need that exists in the drumming world that needs to be fulfilled. And I feel like I have a voice in this kind of missing piece. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's extremely interesting. And I'm glad that uh, I could be a way for you to maybe reach if if 10,000 people watch this and you connect with like 500 on a really deep level or one on a really deep level and it changes how they drum um then that's great you know that's 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 very cool and then they'll tell someone and it'll just help it, it things take time yeah especially with with things like this it's I don't know. I find that sometimes you start to do something and then you fall back into your old ways. I'm speaking pr- about myself. And then you try it again, and you get a little further and then you resort back to what you were doing. But I think it's important to try this stuff and and learn. And this is a good starting point for people to be um, interested in it. So um, yeah, I'll put all the, the stuff in the description for the videos and the TED Talk and everything. So um, Adam, this is awesome, man. I appreciate you reaching out and kind of teaching a different topic and sharing your knowledge. And um, I'm glad to, that, that it's all worked for you and you're back to drumming and it's been been a great experience for you. And um, yeah, man, appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for this platform that you offer to people as such diverse kind of inroads to talking about how we evolved and how drums evolved, how drummers evolved. And I feel like the nervous system has been evolving for millions of years and to really kind of put that in context to see where we've come from. And uh, there's so much more to talk about on that level. And yeah. so it's cool that I'm glad that we've had this opportunity. And yeah, any, any of the audience who wants to reach out, Adam at adamgust.com. I am, I am yearning for connectivity because I feel like <laughs> I'm, okay, I, need, I want to be this liaison between this in- huge body of work that I feel like I've just scratched the surface. And when I come into the drumming world, like there's nobody talking about this or if they are it's on a fairly dare i say superficial level sometimes maybe they're just trying to be connective with their audience but i feel like really the deep work that brilliant people are doing in nervous system research has such a such a foundation to better drumming so i really am so ultimately i want to create a drumming pedagogy that is the clinical application of somatic therapies so that's yep. my end yep. game there's an audience out there for it. Uh, it might not be everyone, but this show in particular, there's this might not be for everyone because it's so history based, but but there's an audience. So just stick with it and um, and I will help any way I can. But uh, again, appreciate you being here and stick with it. It's good stuff. And uh, you're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> so Cheers. Yeah. Thanks, thank Adam. you, Bart.